All right, welcome one and all uh, for this very special edition of uh, Tail Up Goat Wine School. Uh, welcome in particular uh, to those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time. Um, we are absolutely thrilled um, to be hosting our 31st lesson and uh, hosting our 31st lesson uh, in collaboration with an amazing uh, national nonprofit, uh, Active Minds. Uh, we are uh, joined uh, by um, Margo and Bethany, and uh, as well, the founder and executive director of uh, Active Minds, uh, Allison uh, Malman, who uh, hopefully will be finding her way here uh, through the magic of um, uh, her, her phone, uh, forthrightly, um, uh, all the way from Colorado. Oh, Allison, there you are. You, you look lovely uh, <laughs> on, on the phone there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, and uh, we are uh, taking this opportunity uh, to explore uh, a topic that I know a lot of you have wanted to uh, address over the course of our 30 uh, plus now weeks, and that is the magic of uh, wine in context, the magic of uh, wine as it exists with food. And uh, we thought that, um, you know, in light of the fact that uh, we have this amazing community partner in Active Minds, it would be a really uh, fun opportunity to kind of, you know, start at the beginning and consider, you know, how, uh, you know, Zoe and I in particular uh, think about uh, wine and uh, how we uh, like to enjoy it uh, with food. Um, and uh, we've been selling uh, through our restaurant, or we have sold through our restaurant, um, a wine flight. Uh, as well as um, snacks, uh, snack pack to go along uh, with this lesson. Uh, first and foremost, I, I want to uh, stress that there's no right or wrong way to enjoy wine and or food. Um, sense of taste, highly subjective. Um, and uh, if you like, you know, your red wine with uh, sushi, if you like your white wine with steak, there's absolutely nothing uh, wrong with that. Um, you know, we are all hardwired differently and it could be that is the best biological answer uh, for you. And I think, you know, above and beyond, you know, reaching for this quote unquote perfect pairing, which is where a lot of people start for the sake of wine pairing. I think, you know, uh, there's uh, this, you know, Catholic sense that there is this, you know, hard and fast, you know, kind of um, wisdom around what we should be uh, or should not be uh, drinking uh, with food and wine. But I want to move beyond that and I want to live in uh, the mystery uh, of it all and uh, live in uh, the journey uh, of it all and uh, you know consider not only what works but what doesn't work and consider uh, even at a deeper level uh, why it works and uh, today uh, to do so uh, for uh, an amazing cause um, in Active Minds. Uh, Allison, uh, thank you for joining us from Colorado. Allison, can you say hello uh, to everyone? Introduce yourself. Uh, to the people. Hello, I happily will be. I'm Allison Malman. Hello, everybody. I am the founder and executive director of Active Minds. I apologize. I'm having some tech issues today, so you're getting me on my phone. Um, but Bill, I'm just so grateful for you for uh, letting us have this opportunity to do this with you today um, in partnership with a uh, board member of Active Minds, Ami Shah, and her husband, Arjun. And we're just so pleased to be here. So thanks for having us. No, oh, awesome. We are equally thrilled to have you, and uh, you look great on your phone. Uh, once we're a thousand years, uncompromised uh, on uh, all credit in the world to uh, the telecom uh, industry uh, for uh, your your presence here. And uh, should we said, Active Minds, uh, the nations. For those of you that aren't familiar with their work, um, is the nation's leading nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to uh, promoting uh, mental health. Um, and uh, destigmatization of uh, access to mental health, particularly among young adults. And um, uh, they are an organization that has um, over 800 uh, individual branches on um, public school and college campuses uh, throughout the, the country. And um, the organization is devoted to uh, creating a, a sense of community um, uh, and uniting around um, access to mental health, you know, much like, you know, this community is uh, dedicated to enjoying wine uh, and coming together um, while socially distanced um, every, every Sunday. So I think there's definitely uh, synergy there. Um, but uh, we are, are thrilled uh, to have you all uh, with us, Allison. Um, without further ado, um, we're going to kick things off here. Uh, it should be said, I I'm, I'm want to say um, for the sake of our lessons that, you know, you should have multiple glasses, that, you know, it doesn't matter what order you try things in, that, you know, it's all good. Um, I'm going to, you know, be a little more rigorous and scientific for the sake of 
uh, this particular uh, session. And uh, I'm going to uh, go out on the limb and, and say that order does matter uh, a bit. So uh, for those of you, uh, you know, who, who purchased our flight, um, we are going to work our way kind of methodically through these wines. And uh, we're going to do that because, you know, we want to consider the wines, um, you know, on uh, their face and then, uh, you know, kind of uh, prima facie. And then we want to consider the wines in context with food. And, um, you know, to, to do so uh, meaningfully, it, it helps to um, do so in a more organized fashion. So we're going to work our way from, uh, you know, one dimension of kind of wine structure to another. Um, and uh, the dimensions, the four dimensions that we'll consider are uh, uh, acid, acidity, um, sweetness, um, tannin, uh, and alcohol. And we'll describe each of those as we go. But um, for those of you that have the flight, our exemplars are Chablis. We're going to start out there. Uh, Riesling uh, for, for sweetness. Um, uh, Georgian orange wine uh, for, for tannic grip. And uh, Priorat, a, a dense inky Spanish red. Uh, for the sake of alcohol. And we're going to move in that order and we're going to taste in that order uh, with our food. So um, it is uh, more significant for the sake of this lesson that you are uh, following along and on the same page. Um, for those of you that have joined us before, you know that we uh, like to kick things off with uh, a bit of verse. Um, and uh, that seems all the more uh, significant um, for the sake of this um, lesson devoted to uh, mental health, um, you know, outreach and advocacy. And uh, this a uh, bit of verse uh, comes from one of my favorite poets. Uh, this is uh, an old uh, favorite poem um, from uh, Rainer Marie uh, Vilka, uh, who um, in his own life, you know, kind of struggled uh, variously as uh, many of us do um, with his uh, mental health, but um, uh, wrote some of the most profoundly beautiful uh, lyric uh, German poetry in the world. This is uh, an English translation um, of uh, one of his uh, poems. So um, without further ado, um, here. It is for you. Um, quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the change. What is it like such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow, to the rushing waters speak, I am. Uh, love that uh, poem. Uh, that's one that we featured uh, at Tail before, but um, you know, uh, obviously there's a wine connection, which we, which you always love, but uh, the bit of verse itself is um, absolutely uh, beautiful. So um, without further ado, um, let's talk over uh, food and wine pairing. And um, obviously to understand, uh, you know, uh, food as it uh, plays with wine, you need to understand the wine itself. And we're gonna start there and we're gonna consider uh, briefly um, the physiology of taste. Don't tune out yet. Um, uh, the physiology of taste, wildly fascinating uh, for uh, those of us wine nerds. And, um, you know, I think uh, taste in particular smell, um, which is the guiding sense uh, when it comes to our appreciation of wine. So uh, we bring three senses uh, to bear um, in, uh, you know, trying to understand what is in the glass. And they are sight, smell, and taste, but they are not all created equal. We're going to address each, but they are not all created equal. Smell by far uh, the most important. Uh, it's been said that uh, smell accounts for about 90% uh, of our uh, experience of an individual wine. Uh, it's also been said, uh, and I, I love this, that um, uh, about 1% of our human genome uh, devoted to um, the sense of smell, uh, and, which is about the same as the development of our uh, immune system. Um, so, um, you know, equally weighted there. And, and I think in modern life, you know, to the extent that people are overwhelmed by their sense of smell, it's mostly in the context of, dear God, what is that smell? It's more, you know, wandering along a dumpster, alongside a dumpster uh, or dumpster fire, or, you know, um, you know, someone cuts one next to you or whatever it is, but, you know, it's unpleasant uh, as opposed to something that you're actively seeking to train um, and, and fully unravel, but it's, it's all there. Um, we are genetically hardwired uh, to be uh, much more highly attuned to it than I think people commonly access. And people often ask uh, me, you know, oh, you must have this amazing, you know, preternatural, you know, gift for, for you know, smell and taste, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, I certainly do not have a, a preternatural gift for, for hearing or music. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I think I have a decent sense of smell, but I don't think it's like, you know, 
dog, you know, canine worthy or anything special. Uh, I think it's just something that I, I've learned to train. And I think everybody has that. And, you know, I make the analogy um, for the sake of musicians in the audience to, you know, learning the difference between a sharp and a flat note. Um, it's out there. And if someone points it out to you, um, you can distinguish it um, over time. Uh, but if no one bothers to, you know, uh, make that distinction for you, or, you know, you don't uh, listen closely enough to a particular tune, then it's lost on you. And a sense of smell um, uh, works the same way, but it is out there. The, the truth is out there uh, to, to discern, um, you know, if, if we are willing uh, to, to look for it. Um, uh, it should be said that uh, people uh, diverge widely uh, for the sake of uh, their sense of smell. Not everyone experiences it uh, equally. Um, uh, there's actually this huge variance um, for the sake of uh, how many taste buds uh, that we possess uh, from one person uh, to the next. Um, there's this you know, great range. I think a lot of you may or may not be familiar with the concept of a, a super taster, uh, but super tasters um, and women are uh, vastly more likely to be super tasters uh, than men have up to 425 taste buds per square centimeter. And there's a fun popular science experiment that you can run for yourself to uh, figure out how many taste buds uh, that, that you have and whether you're a regular taster or a super taster. Um, uh, Non-tasters uh, at the other end of the spectrum um, have about uh, you know, uh, 90 plus uh, taste buds per square centimeter. Um, and then most people, you know, it is a bell curve, uh, fall somewhere in between They're around 180. And it should be said that for the sake of tasting food and wine, it's kind of best to be somewhere in between. Um, a lot of super tasters don't like um, alcohol uh, because um, they feel the um, intense burn of the alcohol itself, or for the sake of tannins, they feel the intense bitterness of it. For the sake of acidity, um, they fear the harsh searing astringency of it all. Um, so, you know, being in the middle of that bell curve, um, somewhat counterintuitively, um, actually works um, in most folks' favor uh, for the sake of tasting wine. Um, our sense of smell and taste evolves over time as well. So, uh, when we are born, it is much more highly attuned uh, by the time, um, you know, uh, we are in our 60s and 70s, um, it is vastly diminished. Um, that is highly individualized, but um, you know, by the time we're into our 80s, uh, most of us will lose at least 50% of our sense of, of taste uh, and smell, uh, sadly. But, um, you know, um, that said, um, you know, uh, for some people, that 50% uh, goes a much longer way uh, than others. Um, and, you know, even if diminished, you can train it uh, much further uh, than a younger buck uh, would be able to. Um, I'm going to read a, a, a kind of a brief uh, description here. This is from uh, Kevin Zraeli and Wendy Dubit um, talking about, you know, just the, the physiology of taste, uh, and then we'll move into this particular wine because, um, you know, we covered enough popular science for the day, but um, this has to do with um, the immediacy, the, um, you know, kind of uh, primal um, uh, sense that we bring to taste uh, and smell, um, and, you know, how we are genetically hardwired to perceive uh, something as elemental um, as the taste of Chablis uh, in the glass. Uh, memory stored in the limbic system, um, that is the uh, uh, kind of uh, pre-brain um, that uh, is devoted to uh, our emotional responses, um, uniquely links emotional state with physical sensation, creating our most important and primitive form of learning, working memory. We remember smell differently than we recall sight, sound, taste, and touch because we uh, respond to smell the same way we respond to emotion. Uh, an increased heart, heart rate, uh, enhanced sensitivity, and faster breathing. It is this emotional connection that gives smell the power to stimulate memory so strongly and why a single smell can instantly transport us back to a particular time and place. No two people are alike uh, in either how they smell or the smells they perceive. It is deeply personal based on our own memories and unique sets of experience. Um, and I think that's incredibly poetic. Um, I shared uh, for the sake of uh, this lesson, um, a, a really awesome kind of uh, pictorial um, kind of uh, display uh, from Ratatouille. Um, it's this like, uh, you know, visualization of uh, food pairing. And, um, you know, uh, one of my favorite moments from that movie is when the evil restaurant critic Anton Ego um, tastes um, uh, uh, Remy's uh, Ratatouille for the first time. And he is instantly um, transformed into his childhood self, tasting his mom's ratatouille. And, um, you know, I think uh, wine uh, works the same way. I, honestly, I think, I think music uh, can, can transform the same way. But, you know, there's something visceral um, and elemental about it in a way that is totally worth celebrating. Um, all of which is to say that, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do this. You know, 
Um, if for the taste of a particular wine, you know, you get gummy bears or you get, you know, underripe pineapple or you get something, you know, wildly divergent uh, from the rest of us, uh, you are not wrong. You are just, um, you know, a, a glorious uh, individual, um, you know, emotionally tasting as are uh, the rest of us. So uh, without further ado, um, let's taste this particular wine. And there should be said, there are many different ways to experience a wine. Um, uh, the Court of Master Sommeliers uh, has its grid, as does uh, the WSET program. Uh, we are going to speak in terms of uh, those three senses uh, that I spoke to earlier, uh, sight, smell, and taste. And we're going to work our way through the Chablis, which is an exemplar of one dimension of taste, which is acidity uh, for the sake of wine. Um, uh, Zoe, I'm going to kind of kick it off to you because you're a much more rigorous taster. Uh, than I am. Uh, what can the, the sight, the look of this wine, tell us about uh, this particular uh, Chablis? Uh, well, you can see how old it is, certainly by the rim variation, um, if there were any. Um, you can also look to see about alcohol content or if there was any residual sugar by how the tears are going to naturally fall down the glass. Um, and that will also you know, equal the weight of the wine in itself. Um, you can see how it reflects light off, which I don't really think means as much as we might gild the lily and say it does, um, personal opinion, but um, certainly seeing um, any other types of oak influence, if it's a little bit more golden or amber um, versus how bright and light it is. Yeah, so we're just kind of initially in evaluating this wine, and it should be that, you know, it should be said that a lot of folks, um, you know, skip ahead uh, to, um, you know, guzzling uh, the wine right away. And I think, you know, if you're, you know, there are different things, you know, tasting analytically and, you know, tasting for uh, pure um, enjoyment. And, you know, uh, if you skipped ahead already, more power to you. There's nothing wrong uh, with that. But um, we can learn something in, you know, kind of pacing ourselves for the sake of evaluating a wine. We want to understand the Chablis as an exemplar of acidity. And uh, there are four different dimensions we use to kind of determine the structure of a wine. The look of the wine can tell us, as uh, Zoe said, about the uh, age of it. Uh, um, wines, both white and reds, tend to brown. Um, as they get older, it can tell us about the alcohol. Um, wine will tend to drop tears um, if it's more alcoholic or if it has uh, leftover sugar. Um, and um, there are all sorts of other uh, things that can be at play. And then um, smell is the most important. And, and it should be said that, you know, we should spend the most time smelling a wine as opposed to tasting it. You know, that sensual dimension of, of the wine playing on the palate is really important, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis food. Um, but the smell is most instructive. And even when we're tasting we are smelling for the sake of this like wonderful retronasal thing uh, that happens for the sake of these odors working their way through our sinus cavities. And then, um, you know, for the sake of something like Chablis, uh, it's blessedly pure. So uh, Chablis, um, as we smell it, um, uh, I think uh, significant to understand uh, where this particular wine is from. So uh, Chablis, uh, it should be said, uh, hails from uh, France um, and it hails from um, kind of a Northern corner uh, of, of France. So um, it is uh, kind of uh, well north of Burgundy. You can see Burgundy in this lighter red here and then Chablis uh, much further to the north. Um, it is really a separate enclave um, in as much as, um, you know, Beaujolais is separate from Burgundy proper, Chablis uh, is separate. And Chablis is the region, um, the grape here is Chardonnay, but it is very different than the Chardonnay that many of you um, have become accustomed to in the New World in California that's heavily oak. Chablis is a wine of refinement. Um, and in this case from Jean-Claude de Seine is a wine that sees zero oak whatsoever. It is a wine that is grown on uh, these very hugely famous uh, Kimmeridgean um, and Devonian chalk soils that is in a geological era um, in the late Jurassic period. So 140, 150 years ago, when this whole region of France, the Paris Basin, was at the bottom of a shallow sea and over eons, um, these uh, deposits of, um, you know, oysters and other shellfish created uh, this highly chalky rock that um, gives rise to wines that are bright and acid driven and incredibly lean and acidic for the sake of Chablis. Um, and uh, it's, you know, uh, evocative, you know, it is a, a wine grown on ancient oyster beds that goes with oysters that smells a bit like oyster shells. Um, and for me, you know, some of the um, uh, notes I get on the nose with this, um, you know, certainly citrus, you know, certainly some of that like lemon curd, um, certainly some of that, you know, um, water over rocks there, all in the midst uh, there. Um, and then, you know, on the palate, you know, you're initially confronted 
uh, with that perception of acidity. Acidity is something that registers right away. I like to talk for the sake of evaluating a wine in terms of a three act play. So you have the first act, um, the first third, which is attack. And uh, when you're tasting an acidic wine, uh, the first act is always acid. It's a flag that goes up. It's something that registers immediately. Um, and for the sake of Chablis, it registers uh, immediately. And then uh, that resolution, that mid palate is hugely important. It's when you're, you know, more kind of analytically uh, evaluating a wine and trying to understand it at a deeper level. And then that finish is ultimately uh, what you are left with. And we're moving from one uh, to the next as we evaluate this wine. And then as we understand it uh, with food, um, we're gonna wanna try this wine alongside um, different dimensions of uh, taste. Um, for the sake of your snack pack, you have uh, crackers, you have uh, fiery uh, chilied uh, focaccia. You have a couple different cheeses, uh, St. Malachi, a hard salty cheese, and hummingbird. Um, and then you have a fatty liver mousse. Um, you're going to want to work your way through each of those exemplars. And we have, uh, uh, as we work our way through them, salty. And I think that's best exemplified by the hard cheese. You have sour, best exemplified by those tomatillo uh, pickles. Um, you have sweet, uh, best exemplified by that glorious uh, caramel. Uh, peak, uh, kind of like a, a cookie uh, a situation. Um, umami is a dimension of flavor and that's certainly well exemplified um, in uh, the liver mousse. Um, and then, uh, you know, spicy um, uh, physiologically is kind of like a, a on taste buds on tilt, everything firing at once. Um, and you're gonna wanna try this with the, uh, this particular uh, wine uh, as well. And then uh, bitter is another dimension of taste um, that, you know, is, is kind of harder to pinpoint, but we'll talk that over for the sake of tannin. Uh, Zoe, for the sake of this particular Chablis, um, what did you find uh, that it worked best with uh, for the sake of um, uh, the snacks that, you know, you and I uh, sampled it with uh, earlier? You know, what were you uh, pleasantly surprised by for the sake of uh, what went well and what didn't uh, for this first wine? I loved it with the St. Malachi cheese. Um, I thought that that um, caramel richness and how nutty it was, um, was delicious. And then because the Chablis is a lot leaner and doesn't have that like lactic twang or um, any of the like yogurt notes that I sometimes get in Chablis, uh, the cheese really helped finish the rest of that circle off. Um, I also really enjoyed it with the jam, which I wasn't expecting to see. Um, I know that Chef Casey put um, quite a bit of orange and lemon, both zest and juice in it as well. And I think that like citrus element um, really helped it shine. And what uh, did you find it didn't uh, work as well with as a wine that was, you know, drier and acid driven, so? Well, we disagree on this, but I did not enjoy <laughs> it with <laughs> with the green tomato pickle. Um, I thought that it was like too much with the acid and the acid competing. And sometimes acid and acid really do go well together, like Chablis and a citrus fruit or something like that. Um, but it was uh, maybe the vinegar was just a little bit too much. And it should be said for the sake of acidity that, um, you know, the way we perceive different flavors is very different and our threshold uh, for different flavors is very different. So um, it should be said that, um, you know, we have a uh, a very high threshold for, for, for sweetness in food. So until something it tastes sweet to us, you know, it, it's a pretty high bar to cross. Um, the, the bar, um, it should be said uh, for, for sour um, is a little lower, uh, for salty a little lower still. And then uh, for bitter, it's the lowest. So we are much more highly attuned to bitter flavors than any other dimension of taste. And if you think about that evolutionarily, it makes sense because uh, for us as uh, you know, primates, hunter gatherers, Bitter equals poison. So you're going to want to be able to suss out those bitter flavors if you want to survive. It's a little less important to suss out those sweet flavors because they're good for us um, at the end of the day. And, you know, um, if we want to eat all the calories we can, you know, um, you know, a little kind of sensory delay is probably a, a good thing uh, when it comes to that. Now, with respect to acidity, there are actually a lot of different types of acidity when it comes to wine and different types of acid that we can discern between for the sake of a wine. Um, for the sake of most wines, the most important is called tartaric acid. Um, grapes are actually really unique among fruits in being very high in tartaric acid. And tartaric acid can sometimes register as bitter to us, but it's very chemically stable. 
And that is why um, as much as alcohol, uh, as much as sugar in wines, that's why wine is the durable product that it is because of the high uh, levels of tartaric acid. And then, you know, some wines more than others are higher in that particular constituent that makes them age worthy. So the Riesling that we're gonna taste forthrightly um, is incredibly high in tartaric acid, which makes Riesling this incredibly age worthy wine in the way that you wouldn't typically expect of a white. And then you have malic acid, which is the app the apple, kind of green apple acid. Then you have uh, citric acid, which you know is self-explanatory. And then lactic acid, which is the acid in yogurt. And you get conversion of malic acid into lactic acid in a lot of wines during a, a secondary process called malolactic conversion, which we won't talk about uh, at length, but happens in some wines more than others. Uh, significantly didn't happen for the sake of our Chablis. Uh, it should be said that I you know, thought the pickle thing worked. Um, there is an old adage for the sake of wine pairing that um, you uh, buy with an apple and sell with cheese. It's an old English merchant's expression. And uh, that means that it's harder to find a wine to go with something very acidic than it is to find a wine to go with something, you know, rich and fatty. And that is hugely true. Uh, so it is harder to find a wine to go with the pickles uh, or the acidic item on your plate than it is uh, the liver mousses uh, of, of the world. Um, and I want you to kind of experience that for, for yourselves. But I thought the Chablis was a perfectly all right pairing with pickles. I, I like the Riesling a little better with it, another high acid wine with a little bit of sweetness. But, um, you know, uh, again, this is a place where, you know, there are individual individualized preferences and that's totally okay. Um, so uh, having worked our way uh, through this first particular offering, uh, we're gonna kick it back um, to um, uh, founder uh, and Edie Allison um, to say a little more uh, about her uh, work with Active Minds and uh, share uh, her story. Um, uh, Allison, how did uh, Active Minds uh, get its start? I went to school myself um, uh, in the early aughts, not to totally date myself, and there was nothing like uh, Active Minds. I wish there, there had been, but um, how did the organization, um, you know, uh, get, uh, you know, begin uh, its journey? Well, I appreciate the question. And first, again, just want to thank you so much um, for partnering with Active Minds to put forward this incredible special edition of the Tug Wine School. And uh, again, a big thank you to um, our board member, Ami Shah, and her husband, Arjun Shah, both of whom are regulars uh, in this class. And we're just really excited to be able to share. Uh, and congratulations on their, their new arrival as well. So. And indeed, indeed, there's no better way to uh, celebrate the both of them uh, and their new arrival. So, um, you know, just so everybody has a better sense of Active Minds, as Bill shared earlier, Active Minds is uh, the nation's leading nonprofit addressing mental health especially for young adults ages 14 to 24. Uh, if you looked us up before the event or know our story, um, you'll know that Active Minds was born from my grief uh, following the death of my brother, Brian, uh, who died by suicide in the year 2000. Uh, in the weeks following his death, my friends rallied around and worked with me to plan ways to help others that were struggling um, like Brian had been. And the passion I felt and those around me made it seem clear that this generation really could start to change the culture around mental health. And, and that is what Active Minds does. And that's what we do in the 800 plus schools uh, and communities and workplaces that we're in. Um, and we do still to this day, now almost 20 years after I lost my brother. And, you know, changing the culture to us means getting to the day where no one feels that they must struggle alone, um, that, that everyone understands that help is available, that they know where to and how to get help. And we all feel as comfortable talking about our mental health as we do our physical health. My brother had struggled for four years with his mental health before he felt comfortable telling anyone, my mom, myself, um, his friends. And uh, by the time he did seek help for him, it was too late. And so our goal as an organization is to create an environment where we are talking about mental health without shame uh, and sharing our stories openly. Um, since 2003, when I started the nonprofit, we've grown to a nationwide network of advocates um, changing the culture everywhere young adults are, um, in those schools, college campuses, workplaces, communities, all led by this next generation who is talking about mental health in a little bit of a different way um, than so many of us were, were raised in. Uh, every part of our lives affects our mental health uh, and every part of our life we can feel empowered and validated through a positive mental health culture. This is especially important for young adults for whom suicide is the second leading cause of death um, and this year, amidst the pandemic, we are all struggling and young people are especially vulnerable. Uh, and so that's why your support tonight, everybody uh, who's joining us tonight is really already making a difference. 
It's gonna help us bring remote and digital tools to more than 15,000 volunteers who last year reached over 1.8 million people directly through Active Minds programs. Um, and each of you can be a part of changing that culture with us. Uh, if you don't already re feel comfortable reaching out to someone you suspect may be having a tough time, or you sometimes wonder uh, if you're saying the right resources or uh, trying to figure out how to talk to people, just visit our website, activeminds.org, take a look at our resources. Um, it's really simple. You don't have to ex be an expert to, to help, you just need to be there. Uh, and Active Minds has the tools to give you the confidence um, to be a measurable part of changing the way that we all interact around mental health. Um, so that's kind of us in a nutshell. Again, just so so grateful for this opportunity. Um, I think I'm going to pop in again a little bit later, um, but for now, I'll toss it back to you, Bill, so uh, we can try our next pairing. Yeah, great. And, um, you know, it should be said personally that uh, I have struggled with, you know, depression and anxiety throughout my life. Um, you know, I'm still on antidepressants to this day. And, um, you know, it's not something that I'm, you know, I feel awkward about sharing at all. And I, I don't think it should be. I think it's something that people struggle with um, in silence uh, all too all too often. Um, and especially young people, I, I think it's easy, especially when you're first going off to college. Um, and, you know, if your sense of self isn't fully developed to feel alone in your struggles uh, with, with mental health, then um, I think it's usually important to know that other people um, your age are struggling with the same things. I can remember, um, you know, visiting a psychologist in college and, you know, coming out of his office and, you know, the sense of dread that you're gonna run into, you know, one of your, your classmates. And, you know, that is fundamentally preposterous. You know, people are struggling with this across the board and it's not something that, you know, should evoke uh, a sense of shame, you know, far from it. It's a, a sense that, you know, should evoke a sense of shared humanity. And, um, you know, I, I admire your work, um, you know, certainly Allison to, you know, create um, a safe space uh, for dialogues around um, mental health uh, on uh, the college campus, um, you know, and just a young, among uh, younger people uh, more broadly. So, um, without further ado, let's drink some Riesling. So uh, Riesling is one of life's great joys. Um, it is uh, one of the, the most food friendly wines um, in the world. Um, and uh, I want to share a map uh, uh, while I do so. Um, those of you who are um, regular participants know that um, I love uh, maps. Uh, Zoe, uh, do you have any comments? I, I encourage all of you um, to uh, throw out uh, personal best pairings, um, superlatives, and then um, you know uh, worst pairings as well. I think the the bad ones are uh, very often more instructive than than the great ones. Uh, for the sake of uh, your food at, at home, uh, please throw this out, and all the more so um, if you're eating wildly irreverent things. So if you have you know, um, borscht or, you know, um, other crazy foods uh, that you are enjoying above and beyond the snack pack, please let us know um, what goes well and what doesn't uh, with the wines you are, are drinking at home. Uh, so um, any um, news from the commentary? Um, sure, I have a great question. Is um, acidity the reason that it is hard to pair um, wines with asparagus and artichoke? Or why do those vegetables in particular just get a- uh, Weird, so this is, um, that's like a, the Pee Wee Playhouse, like couch is going crazy. So asparagus in particular is a notorious sommelier bugaboo. Um, there, are, there are many sommelier bugaboos and it's never, you know, what you think it would be. Um, uh, it's it actually like, like more kind of vegetable driven dishes tend to be harder to pair with than, you know, things that you might think would otherwise be difficult. But asparagus in particular, in addition to making your pee smell funny, um, has a, a chemical constituent that makes wine seem sweeter than it otherwise is. Um, so uh, it, it actually like uh, uh, changes uh, your perception of taste in a really dynamic and interesting way. Um, one of my favorite pairings uh, with asparagus is, is a wine called uh, Suave uh, from a grape called Garganaga. Um, Suave uh, works really beautifully with, with asparagus. Um, uh, and, and I don't know what the chemical underpinnings for that are, but uh, I find with asparagus, you want something that has a certain like greenness to it. So like Gruner Veltliner is another wine that works really well with vegetables because it has like a, a green, almost vegetal quality to it. And, and you know, sometimes with pairings, you, you, you kind of contrast. Um, so very often, uh, and I hope you found, uh, for those of you participating from home, you know, that some of these, you know, high acid wines, they work nicely with fattier foods, um, sometimes better than others. Um, you know, like the Chablis with the liver mousse, for me, fell a little flat. It, it got a little lost. But, you know, with, with uh, the salty cheese, I thought it was great. Um, and, you know, that's because, it, you know, it, it, it is a, a bit of a saber that cuts through some of that, that saltiness. 
Um, and sometimes you want to kind of like, sometimes you want that saber, but sometimes you want an analog. And I find with things like asparagus and artichokes, typically you want, you know, something that is kind of briny and savory um, as well. What else you guys have? Um, <laughs> great question here. Um, how does your taste evolve after multiple glasses of wine, Bill? Um, it, you know, like many things in having multiple glasses of wine, I'm sure it's diminished. Um, I always find that um, there's this fascinating, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a, a steady, uh, you know, straight line, though. I find it's a bit like, um, uh, it's like a linguistic curve. So I know a lot of people, you know, who speak other languages, you know, they're familiar with the notion that, you know, maybe you speak a little better, or at least, you know, um, you know, the, uh, the words come to you um, a little more freely after like a glass. Um, but, you know, after several glasses, it all gets really messy. Um, I find I find that's you know there's some of that true. So I find that you know um, the you know associations come to me you know a little faster if, if I've had like you know glass glass and a half. But um, uh, it, it steadily diminishes thereafter. So um, you know it's it's always it's always a fine line in terms of that you know little bit of helpful buzz versus you know um, too much um, inebriation that you know kind of ruins the roost. Uh, but awesome. you know, you, I, I will say those though, like um, your taste buds do get fatigued though. So uh, it is a bit like looking at the sun. Um, if you try too much stuff, then you, you know, just, you lose any tense sense of taste, which is like why the whole Robert Parker sitting down with a hundred wines and giving scores after tasting 80 is like morally debased because the only thing you can taste after 80 wines is like, you know, bullshitty raisin wines. Um, you know, that, that's why he likes them to some extent. Some of the favorite pairings so far are Chablis with the Hummingbird, um, along with the Riesling with the Hummingbird. Nice. Um, I think everyone's mostly on the Riesling right now, um, but going with um, uh, the Focaccia with the Calabrian chili oil as well. Um, and then some folks who are out of town, not necessarily going through the tasting that we had, but a uh, great Pinot Grigio with jalapenos. Um, and someone else has a Riesling with a Habanero honey, which I absolutely love that um, combination too, where it's a little sweet and it's a little spicy. Yeah, so let's let's talk about recently. That's a great segue, Zoe. Um, so uh, I wanted to bring up a map uh, featuring isotherms. Uh, very exciting. So um, this is uh, average uh, annual temperature, um, and uh, obviously uh, this is changing a lot as the world warms. All of these isotherms are moving north and south. Um, but uh, you get a sense. This is the band in which uh, the grape vine, Vitis vinifera, so the the grape that goes into all fine wine, comes from a, a species of vine. Um, called Vitis vinifera, which originated in Georgia, spoiled alert for the next wine, um, the country, mind you, not the, the state, in Transcaucasian region right here. Um, and it thrives between uh, what is uh, 30 uh, degree and 50 degree uh, latitude, or between, uh, typically they'll say like 10 or 20 degrees Celsius, but actually uh, this is probably a more accurate um, uh, trope, uh, 12 and 22. Um, but this is the band we're working with for the sake of fine wine. And um, the first couple wines we're tasting are closer to the northern edge. So, you know, when you taste a wine, I think, you know, sometimes you get a kiss of the north wind. Sometimes you get, you know, a more sun-kissed, uh, you know, kind of southern Mediterranean quality. And I think the, the two wines we're starting with uh, have that, you know, kiss of the north wind uh, about them. Um, this particular wine is from Germany, um, Deutschland, um, uh, land of uh, my forebears, um, some of my forebears, not all of my forebears, um, in spite of appearances. Um, but uh, it is from uh, the Rhein-Hessen, which is uh, one of the most important regions for Riesling in the world. Rhein-Hessen is this light blue region right here. Uh, this is the Rhine, which is the uh, German Ganges. It flows from south to north. Uh, this particular wine from the Roter Hung, uh, which means the red bank um, uh, along the western edge of the Rhine here. It comes from essentially Grand Cru vineyards. Uh, but this is a Cabinet Riesling. Cabinet is a designation for um, the ripeness level of the grapes at harvest. Um, typically, it corresponds to a delicately sweet wine. This one is, is a little drier uh, than it, it has been in other vintages. That changes quite a bit. Cabinet, um, as a designation, doesn't assure a certain level of sweetness. So, um, you know, I, I feel like I put the cart before the horse, but uh, for the uninitiated, this whole notion of, of talking about a liquid wine as dry is kind of fundamentally preposterous and counterintuitive, but um, we're just talking about this notion that there's no um, perceptible sweetness in a wine. Um, to say dry means that there is no perceptible sweetness, which is to say there's no residual sugar, um, which is to say that we cannot, um, uh, as humans, perceive sugar um, below the threshold of about, you know, three to five grams per liter. 
um, uh, residual sugar left over in a wine. All wine has a little bit of sugar left in the mix. Um, yeast does this amazing job of converting sugar uh, into alcohol and CO2, but it never completes the job as such. And then the Germans kind of embrace that a little more fully for the sake of the Riesling, and they leave a little bit of extra sweetness in the mix. And that's the idea here. Um, this is a high acid and high uh, uh, or higher sugar wine. Uh, it actually corresponds more closely to a German designation called fine herb, which is a little drier than your average German cabinet, uh, even though it is labeled as cabinet. It's a great wine. Um, I think it would be fun to try something that's a little sweeter. So if you're at home and you want to doctor this wine a little bit and add a little bit of uh, like simple syrup or honey or just even a little table sugar to it and swirl it around, um, you know, get a, get a sense for how the wine changes as you do that. The bouquet will change. Um, the perception of fruit will change. The perception of fruit will be a little riper. The way it interacts with food will change. Um, Zoe, what were your favorite pairings uh, with uh, the Riesling? Um, I loved it with the hummingbird cheese. That's the softer cheese. Um, and then I absolutely loved it with the chicken liver mousse with a little bit of that jam on top. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Riesling um, is amazing insofar as it works with these massive uh, flavors. Um, so... Uh, you know, you think about something like a, a liver mousse. It's, it's a huge um, flavor, uh, uh, liver mousse, but um, it should be said that it goes really beautifully with what otherwise is a, a pretty delicate wine. And, and that's the, the glory of Riesling. I think, you know, Riesling proves that, um, you know, uh, strength is not synonymous, you know, with, you know, big, bold, blustery bullshit. Um, you know, hopefully... Uh, you know, our president has woken woken us up to that. You know, like, you know, you don't have to be a total asshole or take over the room to be strong. You can be, you know, thoughtful and elegant and, you know, uh, lithe and, you know, galetic and graceful and be equally as strong as the big bruising entity in the room. And I think that's an important lesson in wine uh, as, as it is in life. Um, uh, Zoe, is there anything that the Riesling didn't work uh, for you with? Um, so... I mean, I think that Riesling just goes with everything. Um, but going from the chat, um, there was a, quite a few people who did not like the Riesling with the hummingbird a cheese um, or the, the uh, jam or the-, the cheese. Yeah, I, I, could, I could see that. I, I think that this Riesling in particular has more of that green apple um, that, you know, uh, it doesn't have the weight that you want for a, a softer cheese. Um, I think it's really good with the same Malachi. I think it's great with the chicken liver mousse, but with the soft rind cheese, I think you want something broader and more expansive. And, and I don't think this particular Riesling does that. I think, you know, if we had something that was a little sweeter, like a Schwedese or like an older Auslese, um, you know, that would be, you know, wunderbar. But, you know, this particular Riesling doesn't, doesn't do that quite as well. Absolutely. Um, I really like the Annabel and Michael said that it's a skeleton key of wines, which I yeah. think is like the perfect way. I'm just gonna quote that, for, I think, forever now. Um, what about you? What did you think that the Riesling didn't pair with? Uh, you know, I, I am, Zoe, you know that I'm an avowed Riesling lover, so it, it pains me to admit that it doesn't pair with anything. Um, you know, this, I, I think, you know, there, there's Riesling as a whole, which, you know, there is a Riesling to go with any shape or size of dish. But in terms of this particular Riesling, I would agree with the, the folks who commented about the hummingbird. I didn't think it, it worked quite as well um, with that. I was actually surprised it went as well as it did with the... Um, uh, the um, cookie uh, situation. I, I thought that was actually really lovely. Um, and it speaks to how good Annie is at what she did. You know, it's like a caramel inflected thing, but it doesn't taste cloying. And, and I thought the Riesling was really delightful with it. Um, I thought it was killer with the pickles. I thought it was great with liver mousse. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, Riesling is, is you know, a, a glory uh, and, and enjoy that way. Um, and we're gonna uh, take that opportunity, uh, Zoe, to move to another skeleton key of a wine. This is uh, orange wine. So um, for the uninitiated, um, what is this orange madness? Um, uh, it should be said that uh, orange is a separate genre. Um, and it's, it's very simple. Um, uh, it is a, a very old thing that involves a certain amount of hipster rebranding. I don't have the tattoos for it. I have the terrible beard for it now. But um, it should be said that orange wine is uh, just as simple as uh, making wine from white grapes, but whereas under normal circumstances uh, with a white wine, uh, such as the Chablis or the Riesling that we initially tried, you would press the juice directly off the skins. 
uh, for the sake of this wine, which has this, you know, magical amber color, uh, you leave the grape skins in the mix. Um, so uh, that is to say, you leave the wine on the skins. Um, and it should be said that wine derives its color, whether white or red, um, except for individual circumstances, um, from the skins. So all the pigments that determine the color of a wine come from the skins of the grapes. Therefore, um, it is necessary to leave uh, a wine on the skins during the winemaking process in order uh, for it to soak up a bit of color. Now, um, in the case of a red wine, it is picking up red pigments from uh, a, a group of chemical constituents called anthocyanins. In the case of white wines um, or orange wines, there are no red pigments to uh, soak up. So um, the wine uh, is uh, not red as such, but um, you know, not white either. So, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, Williamsburg Hipster said, let's call it orange. Um, uh, in Georgia, that would be profane. Um, they actually, like the best Georgian uh, translation would be amber. And I think amber is much more poetic than orange. Orange, yeah, orange is just not, uh, that doesn't do it for me. Amber, you know, feels, uh, you know, timeless. You know, amber, amber, it's like topaz. It's just like, a, it's a better color word. Um, but at any, word, at any rate, like orange has become the brand, so we're stuck with it, yada, yada. Uh, this one's from Georgia, uh, the country, uh, damn it, not the state. Um, uh, Georgia is a birthplace of wine as we know it. Um, uh, this one comes from Kiketi. Uh, that is the uh, region, kind of like a, a Euphrates tiger situation with dueling river valleys uh, on the eastern edge of the country. Um, we've been talking uh, wines from cooler climates in Chablis and uh, the Rheinhessen in Germany. Uh, this is a, a bridge. So uh, Georgia is uh, trapped between uh, the continent Europe and Asia and, and has uh, cooler climates uh, in the West um, and then uh, drier, more arid com, uh, kind of climates um, uh, as you go further East. And this hails from the, the drier uh, corner and a grape in Kisi that has this um, more profoundly kind of, um, you know, dried apricot, sun-kissed kind of quality to it. Now, um, uh, tannins uh, come from a number of different sources um, in wine. Uh, they are long chain um, uh, you know, kind of uh, chemical uh, constituents, um, and uh, they come, they can come from the stems, seeds, skins of grapes, uh, but also from oak, um, if a wine uh, is aged uh, in oak, and uh, these complex polyphenols, uh, they get longer and longer as a wine ages, they get longer and longer as grapes ripen, uh, somewhat counterintuitively, um, as they get longer, we actually lose our ability to perceive them. So when the tannins get too long, they kind of fall out of a wine uh, for the sake of the wine itself, literally. Um, and you see tannins fall out in the form of wine crystals or tartaric acid um, at the bottom of a wine. Um, and you, you see wines fall out as wine ages for the sake of your, your palate. Um, as fiercely tannic wines age, they get softer. Um, uh, for the sake of our, our perception. Uh, and that is uh, because the tannins lengthen and link one to the next and we lose our ability to perceive them. And then um, for the sake of food and wine, tannins do this glorious dance with fatty foods, with that umami dimension of flavor where they link, they cohere. Um, and then they do this glorious dance occasionally with bitter flavors where they cancel each other out and illuminate other aspects of the wine in a wonderful way. Uh, Zoe, for your sake, um, this is uh, a tannic white wine, which is rare, and I chose a orange wine because, you know, for me, it more fluidly and, you know, kind of singularly isolates this dimension of wine taste, which is tannin, more than red. You know, especially coming from white wines, I think you get a fuller sense of what tannins are in coming to a tannic white than you would if you switched to a tannic red. Uh, what did you like as a pairing with this particular offering, So, I really liked it with the chicken liver mousse. Um... And I actually really enjoyed it with the pickles, which I thought was quite surprising. Um, I thought that there would be just too much going on, but it was a fun little party. Um, and then I really, really, really enjoyed it with the caramel Sammy as well. Um, that was like a peanut butter and jelly kind of a situation, which I'm always down for. A little sweet, a little nutty, a little salty. Uh, what did what did you not like it with? Um, whew. I think the hummingbird, I think that creaminess, although the tannins I thought would conceptually like cut through that softness of the cheese, um, it was just a little bit too soft. And I think that they were too much of competing flavors where the St. Malachi, the harder cheese, that caramel richness, and then plus all that like saffron and pine nut, like black tea-ness of the Kisi just like works so well together. Yeah, it should be said that this is a place where Zoe and I disagree again. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the, 
the uh, uh, Georgian orange wine. And this is from a grape called Kisi. Um, and, and for me, Kisi, uh, so Georgia has well over 450, uh, possibly over 500, depending on who you listen to, native grapes. Um, which is to say they're, they're in, you know, kind of indigenous to that particular region of the world, which again speaks to the fact that um, the very great vine that almost all fine wines come from is thought to have originated there. Um, Kisi being one of them has this kind of a, uh, persimmon-like astringency to it. Um, and I thought if you try the pickle alone with the, so something as fiercely acidic with the more tannic wine, I thought that was like gross. That was one of my least favorite pairings. Um, and, and there is uh, scientific resonance there because acidity tends to heighten our perception of bitterness. So, you know, you have these very variables of taste uh, isolated, but they interact one with another. They interact within the wine and then they interact between food and wine. So if you change one, it's not a simple case of just dialing down something. If you dial down something, you change the whole in a dynamic way that makes it utterly different. So it is a, a complex ecology of taste as opposed to, you know, something as simple as, you know, isolating a, a singular variable. Um, I will say that I was surprised by how much I like this with the, um, the sweet uh, cookie. Um, and uh, for me, this is a wine that, again, like is a skeleton key. Um, in Georgia, the style of dining is not unlike um, uh, if you take, you know, the snack pack and then just like make it a whole meal. You know, that's kind of like the way Georgians dine. Um, and it becomes this war of attrition where they keep throwing so imagine if they just like threw new snack packs at you, you know, until you had to wave a white flag. And that is the Georgian Supra. And the beauty of wines like this is that they're very dynamic in terms of the way they work with different food, in terms of the way they evolve over the course of the meal and over the course of a glass. And, um, you know, that is what I love about them. That's what other, you know, nerdy psalms love about them. And I hope um, that's what uh, you at home uh, are enjoying about them. Um, without further ado, uh, we have one more wine to taste, but... Uh, we're going to give it over um, again uh, to Allison uh, to talk a little more about her work at Active Mind. So Allison, kick it. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, well, before class ends, I want to celebrate the incredible support of everyone attending already today. Um, before the event even started tonight, we had we raised over $6,000 to support mental health tools and resources to help young adults understand their mental health um, and to comfortably speak about with peers about their struggles, and it's incredible. If you haven't already contributed, or if you're willing to give just a little bit more to help our movement continue to grow, there is a QR code on the screen being shared. Uh, there we go, perfect. Um, hover your phone camera that's, over the code. That's my cue, Allison. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> you got it. Um, hover your phone camera over the code. Um, that will cause a banner to pop up at the top of your phone. If you click on that banner, it'll open up a web browser to make a donation right now. Uh, we came in today's, into today's event having raised $6,202 to be exact, uh, and I'm hoping that you'll help us reach $7,000 before the day is out. If you're having any problems making the donation, please feel free to put a note in the chat box and one of the members of the Active Minds team will reach out to help. Um, and again, a very big thank you to each of you that has contributed in honor of tonight's event. And to those of you donating right now, I also want to take a moment and thank our sponsors who have helped Active Minds raise more than $175,000 during our fall fundraiser called All In for Active Minds, which, of which this event is a part. Um, thank you to the Rabo Family Foundation, Stephen Charla Lerman, Theory Chasing, and Tatiana Cooper, Diane and John Tape De Podesta, ECMC, the Elno Family Foundation, Excelicon, Farley and Partners, LLP, Sherry Haver and Michael Mandel, Marla and Alan Levine, Leslie Howard Stein, Richard Steinwurzel, Tiny Jewelbox, and a big thank you to all of you for bringing your wine glasses, your good spirits, and your financial support this afternoon. Back to you, Bill. Great. Uh, I'm going to leave the QR code up uh, as we initially uh, talk over um, uh, our fourth wine uh, for the sake of the flight. So we've talked uh, acid, we talked uh, sugar. Uh, we talked tannin, um, and now we're going to talk over uh, alcohol, um, which, um, you know, many of you are feeling uh, at home, uh, but uh, it is a, a significant uh, dimension of taste, and it, it's fascinating, um, you know, alcohol gives weight, gives perceptual weight to wine, but it also transforms <laughs> wine. So if you add um, alcohol to an existing wine, 
It can throw things out of whack. And wine, good wine, like good food, good life, it's all about balance. And um, if you were to say, and I've done this uh, or did this exercise with our staff very often, you know, just add, you know, a little bit of, you know, pure ethanol to a wine. Not only does it, you know, transform, um, you know, the, the perception of alcohol in the wine in the palate, but it tends to actually mute or dim, um, you know, certain aromatics. Um, and, you know, so it, it changes the totality and it, it skews this uh, wine ecology um, in, a, in a demonstrable way. So um, we're moving on to red. I thought, you know, it would be fun to play with um, uh, red fruit on top of um, alcohol um, for the sake of this particular um, offering. And uh, it should be said that uh, this particular region um, is uh, a sun-kissed corner of Spain. So, you know, we talked over, uh, you know, a couple wines from northern climes, um, at this point moving to something from a, a decidedly uh, sunny corner uh, of the universe. So um, Priorat is uh, just west of Barcelona. Um, you can see it here. Um, it is the kind of like center of the caramel surrounded by uh, Mont Sant here. And it is a find, um, you know, by uh, the southerly locale, um, but also by this really cool um, localized type of uh, soil. It's actually one of my favorite um, wine soils to pronounce uh, because you get to lean into a double L. It's called uh, Icorela. Icorela. Um, and these are uh, pre-rot vines being harvested on Icorela soils. Uh, Icorela is uh, a type of black slate. Um, and slate does a lot of things uh, uh, for the sake of vineyards, but um, you get amazing drainage on uh, these very poor uh, soils, but uh, also you get, you know, this amazing, um, you know, concentration of heat. Um, so they are sun soaked, you know, much as asphalt is, and they communicate that to the vines uh, for the sake of ripening. And I think you get a sense of that for the sake of this wine. So I wanted to find something that, um, you know, had a really pronounced, um, you know, kind of uh, fullness of uh, alcohol um, but, you know, without an overt uh, dimension of tannins, because very often those things go hand in hand. You know, when you get high, high alcohol wines, they're also very tannic. Uh, this does see a bit of oak. Um, uh, it sees, you know, mostly large uh, neutral oak uh, from Alvaro Pracios, who's kind of one of the foremost modern Spanish wines of this era, uh, from a very proud family of, uh, of vineyards in Rioja. Uh, but he's spread his wings and uh, put uh, Bierzo back on the map, put Priorat back on the map. He is, um, you know, deserves as much credit as anyone else for um, making Spain the wine destination that it is today. Um, but his wines are, are forward, modern, um, you know, and, and you know, they're, they're very approachable. And I think you get a sense of the alcohol in this wine, even on the nose. Um, and, uh, you know, it, you know, for the sake of our exercise, I, I want you to think of how that weight, think about how that weight plays with, uh, you know, the individual dishes and, and whether that, you know, added alcohol, you know, plays well or, um, you know, doesn't play well uh, with friends uh, for the sake of food. Uh, so um, what were your takeaways uh, for the sake of the pre wrap um, with the individual uh, offerings? And, and again, uh, we've been, you know, uh, talking over these wines very quickly um, for the sake of, of technical specs, but we had the Chablis, Chablis, the region, Chardonnay, the grape, the Riesling, uh, which is the grape, uh, it's from a, a German region of Rheinhessen, uh, Kisi, the grape, uh, uh, Georgia, the country, the region, Kakheti, and then in this case, um, a wine that, you know, goes by the Old World Convention, identified um, by the particular region, which is Priorat, um, which I showed you on the map, uh, but the grapes are a bit of a hodgepodge, so you have uh, Garnacha, uh, Garnacha, uh, which is just uh, fun to say, um, and it helps to do the shimmy, um, uh, that's 35%, uh, Carniena, um, otherwise known as Carignan, Otherwise known as Mosuelo. Um, then uh, more ubiquitous, uh, Syrah, Cab Sauv, Merlot, uh, but less fun to shimmy to. Uh, but uh, so uh, for the sake of this wine uh, with food, what worked, what didn't uh, work for you um, about this one? I hated the Priorat with the pickles. Um, yeah, that was yeah. And then, so again, you know, uh, pickles are divisive. Pickles, again, it goes back to that English merchant expression, um, you know, buy with buy with an apple, uh, pair with cheese. Uh, I, I vehemently uh, disagree with Zoe's uh, uh, orange wine take on the pickles, but we're going to move past that. But we both hated this with the pickles, so uh, we can agree on that. I wrote, ooh, David, end point. Um, I really enjoyed it with the chicken liver mousse. Um, I thought that that was really nice with all and, of that ripe fruit and the high and alcohol. And that is a place where, it's funny, 
I think people, when they pair, they want to jump to this place of tasting notes. So they want to say that because, you know, something tastes like blueberries, it's going to go with blueberries. And, you know, I think it's much more important to start with the building blocks, start with the mouthfeel, start with, you know, um, these basic elements that we have addressed for the sake of talking through the wines, acid, sugar, um, tannin, and alcohol. Start with that skeletal structure um, and, and find food that matches that mouthfeel. Don't worry about, you know, the tasting notes as such. Start with, you know, texture um, and build out from there. But, you know, that's not to say that, you know, fruit, quality fruit is not important. And I think, you know, that liver mousse pairing with jam in particular is a place where quality of fruit, you know, really shines through uh, for the sake of this wine. And, you know, to have, you know, that like, you know, jammy, you know, berry fruit constituent makes this really sing. Exactly. I thought it mocked a lot of the flavors in the um, honey grape jam, um, particularly with that like star anise going through as well. Um, I liked it with the hummingbird. Um, I just wish that there had either been a little bit more tannin in the Priorat to be able to like cut through that fattiness. Um, but I thought that it shined better with the nuttiness than the St. Malachi for sure. Yeah, I, I, I really liked it. I like it with the kind of hard salty cheese. Um, and I do find that red wines broadly, um, especially bigger red wines tend to work with harder cheeses um, as opposed to softer ones. Um, you know, that, that, that's not universal. Um, and, and again, for, for those of you playing along at home, I, I really, you know, want to, if you're one takeaway, you know, uh, if, if you have one takeaway, I want it to be that, you know, you should live in the mystery and have fun with all this shit. You know, I want to get past this notion that there is a sacrosanct version of one wine to go with one dish. It doesn't work that way. You know, um, you know, the, the fun of it all is in trying things together. The first rule of it all is, A, drink what you like, eat what you like. That is the overarching rule. Life is too fucking short not to do so. Um, you know, so if you want to drink, you know, pre rot with your, you know, green tomato pickles and you like that, go for it. You know, you shouldn't care what Zoe and I have to say about it. Um, you know, so that, that's rule number one. But I, I think rule number two, though, is, is you know, uh, for the sake of these issues, that texture, mouthfeel, matters. I think that that is something that people vastly underestimate. And, and people who taste wine for a living, they tend not to kind of put the cart before the horse. They tend not to race the tasting notes. They tend to think more in terms of where wine lands, vis-a-vis uh, -vis alcohol. And, 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 and for alcohol, we tend to think in terms of, you know, how far does it slide, you know, down your throat? You know, is it, you know, like a bourbon or a brandy, you know, working its way all the way, you know, down your gullet? Is it, you know, kind of dissipating you know, at the front of your palate, you know, for, for something lower alcohol, you know, for the sake of something acidic, you know, is it, you know, you know, giving you that like twinge in the back of your ear, like a good lemon curd, um, you know, uh, for the sake of, you know, something, you know, tannic, is it, you know, drying out your mouth like a, like a black tea for the sake of something, you know, sweet, is it, you know, obviously cloying, you know, those are the dimensions of taste we tend to live with and work in preparing. It, it's less about, you know, um, flowerly just flowery descriptions and it is those fundamental building blocks. Um, and then the, I think the last piece that's instructive for the sake of, of this exercise with this wine and, you know, the liver mousse and the, and the sauce is that, you know, you pair for the most prominent flavor. Um, I'm doing the, the Kennedy uh, pair for them, uh, but you do like in a dish. And, and when I, when I'm working at the restaurant, you know, so you've got a protein, you got steak, but you know, you've got steak with the sauce. You pair for the sauce. You don't necessarily pair for the protein. You pair for the most prominent uh, flavor. Uh, in in addition, that's not always the um, most prominent ingredient. And and I think you know um, when you're at home, you know, kind of playing around with things. You know, I, I think it's important to do so. And then lastly, um, I would say you know don't assume it is a one way street where you know the food is done and you got to find the wine to work along with it. You can play with both. So uh, particularly in terms of acid. Um, you can kind of, you know, uh, mess with the acidity on a dish. So, you know, if you have an acid driven wine and it seems a little too acidic for the food, um, you can add a little salt uh, to your cuisine to dampen the perception of acidity in your food. Uh, conversely, um, you know, if you feel like the food needs, you know, something to give it a little more lift, you know, just add a little lemon juice, add a little sherry vinegar um, and you can transform a pairing. Um, uh, you know, you can work backwards uh, the same way 
you work uh, with with wine uh, retroactively, or you know, work for it, or I don't know which direction we're in. But anyway, you can transform a dish as much as you can transform the wine, um, and that can be equally fun uh, to to play around with. Um, so, any closing thoughts about the pre rock uh, in particular, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, this particular uh, exercise? I thought it was really instructive with the uh, the focaccia with all the Calabrian chili oil. It obviously heightens up that spice. Um, when I was slinging a lot of Indian food and re-sling, um, that was really something that I always kept in mind as if there was any really high alcohol wines that for spicier dishes, it just, you know, it puts your mouth on fire. You can't taste anything else. Um, so that's always really instructive. If the Riesling were a little bit sweeter, I think it would have been able to like calm that down and then also have the acid that like washes out the palate and all of the oil that's in the focaccia. Um, but this being a you know, slightly more drier than I think we were expecting is still instructive nonetheless. Yeah, totally. And, uh, and spicy in particular is a really fun dimension of, of flavor to play around with. And it should be said that, you know, in terms of like the biological mechanism of spicy, it's not a particular taste receptor. So, you know, uh, the I didn't share uh, the tongue map. Um, I, I should have, um, and, and I will now, but, you know, there is this antiquated notion of the tongue map uh, which is total bullshit, um, it should be said. Um, each of our, you know, whether you're a super taster or a non-taster, uh, taste buds has all the receptors, essentially. So uh, bitter, uh, salty, uh, sour, sweet, they're all in the mix on an individual receptor. Um, you know, there is there is no tongue map. It, it's, it's pseudoscience. Um, and I think it's important to, to understand that. Um, umami is a taste, but it's, it's more of a sensation. Um, than it is a, a, a taste as we understand the other dimensions. And then spicy is like a, again, I, I referenced Pee Wee's Playhouse, but it is a, uh, all the couches going off at once, kind of short circuiting of the system. Um, so it just activates everything all at once. So that's what spicy does. Um, and there are, are various ways to mitigate spice. The most effective honestly is, is milk. Um, lactic acid, if you're really suffering you know, at a Thai restaurant, uh, drink a glass of milk. It's the best, one of the best ways to do it. But uh, sugar uh, does that really beautifully, which is why sweeter Riesling, sweeter wines in general are wunderbar with sweet food. And I hope you got a sense of that with the focaccia at home. Uh, but there are a lot of things that work against spicy. So high acid and tannin in particular exacerbate the perception of uh, spiciness in foods in, um, you know, a, uh, you know, harmful uh, way. Uh, for the, the sake of enjoyment of, of food uh, and wine. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to have a deep thought for you, but, um, uh, and, and we'll have questions uh, from the commentary for both uh, myself uh, and Zoe about the wines and such, and Allison about her work. But um, Allison, I want to give you a chance to um, uh, throw out any, any final thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm really mad that you don't have a glass of wine on your person. Uh, she's participating for Denver, so in your defense, it's only four o'clock there um, now. It's, it's not, it's not, you know, quite happy hour. But um, uh, what would you like to lead us out with, Alison? I, I am also personally um, pretty disappointed. I also have little children running around, so the <laughs> combination of the the midday Sunday yeah. and yeah. Uh, little children, I need multiple. Uh, but I have learned so much. Um, and again, I just want to thank everybody. So much. Um, I want to thank you, Bill, and um, the, the whole class for inviting Active Minds into this. This is, you know, the the work that we do at Active Minds is meant to touch everybody because we all know um, that everyone uh, is touched by mental health, and we're doing all that we can to create an environment where people can share their stories, just like you did uh, earlier on. And it, it, there is no stigma, there is no shame. Uh, we can talk about the, the help that we seek and the help that we need, and then we have in our families. Uh, and we're only doing that through the support and help of, of all of you. So um, just a big thank you. If anybody is interested in learning more and hasn't gotten what you've needed out of it today, um, you can visit our website, which is activeminds.org. And you can also email us at events at activeminds.org. Thank you, Bill, for putting the QR code back. Um, and this is an, an opportunity to be able to give um, via this event. And again, a big thank you to Ami and Arjun for helping us get this set up. Um, one quick fundraising update. We have raised over $9,000 through this event. Our goal well, was seven and we blew past that. Um, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So uh, a huge, huge thank you. Maybe we can hit 10 um, and we're just so grateful and um, hope to be able to work with, with all of you again and um, really appreciate you welcoming us into this 
uh, opportunity this afternoon. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, just, you know, for the sake of uh, final thoughts here, um, as I leave the QR code up, um, one of my favorite things about uh, wine and then, and then wine and food in general is that, um, you know, it, it brings, it is a bridge of sorts. So, you know, you have this, you know, kind of uh, primal, um, you know, uh, sense that is smell um, and taste that is all about the, the limbic system and, you know, it is, is irrational, fundamentally irrational, emotional. Um, and then, you know, you, you take it when it, it comes to something, you know, like uh, bringing food and wine together and you intellectualize it and wine, wine in, in itself is, is uh, you know, um, something that lends itself uh, to um, erudition and, 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 you know, you want to kind of pick it apart and break it down. Uh, but I, I love that, you know, combination of, of something that is, you know, of the flesh and blood and then, you know, something that reaches for uh, something uh, more, more timeless. And, um, you know, I, I think there, there's, there's poetry there and, and, and certainly, um, you know, I spoke to this earlier, but, you know, it, it reminds us um, all of uh, how we uh, relate, um, you know, uh, to ourselves, to our own senses, but also uh, one to the other. And then um, I have a final quote before we toast. Um, this is uh, from Pablo Neruda. This is from his uh, Nobel lecture. Um, it is um, one of my favorite, um, you know, quotes of its kind of all time. But um, at any rate, uh, Neruda closed out his lecture as such uh, in Spanish, but obviously uh, translated into English. Uh, there is no insurmountable solitude. All paths lead to the same goal, to convey to others what we are. And we must pass through solitude and difficulty, isolation and silence in order to reach forth to the enchanted place where we can dance our clumsy dance and sing our sorrowful song. But in this dance or in this song, there are fulfilled the most ancient rites of our conscience in the awareness of being human and of believing in a common destiny. So. Cheers to you all, alone together, as always. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so. All right, Zoe, what do you got for us? How do you pair wine with desserts? Ooh, uh, fun question. So um, uh, this is a place where there is actually a hard and fast rule that I hard and fast abide by. So um, I, A, First and foremost, I love, love, love dessert wine. I lament the fact that, um, A, no one orders dessert wine. So, you know, if you want to ingratiate yourself to your, you know, nerdy sommelier friend, order dessert wine. You know, if you like your company, you know, extend the meal. It's so good. Like, dessert wine is, is very much the original wine. Um, uh, sweet wines in antiquity were the most lauded wines. They age incredibly beautifully. Um, they're, they're so good. Don't don't let anyone think that or tell you that, you know, sweet wine is morally debased. I think people feel guilty for liking sweet things, like lean into it, like just go. Um, but uh, when it comes to pairing with desserts, there is a hard and fast rule um, that, you know, biologically works and is important um, with a few exceptions that are, that are mostly spirit forward for chemical reasons that we're not gonna touch on for this class. But if you're working with unadulterated wine, the wine itself kind of has to be as sweet as or sweeter than the dessert. That's just how it works. Otherwise, the wine just gets lost. Um, the dessert runs roughshod over it and makes the wine seem insipid, um, even if it's amazing. Um, please, you know, like like some fruity reds. So I was I was pleasantly surprised how well the coming worked with the the sandy. But like, it's not a great pairing. They're they're that that's like. It's like an unobjectionable pairing. It's not a great pairing. Great pairings are that convergence where, you know, uh, there is this greater whole. So, uh, you know, the, the Hippocratic oath of some life is first do no harm. So, you know, at, at the base level, you don't want to, you know, mess with the food. So, you know, the food should always come first, you know, and you as a some don't want to, you know, ruin people's enjoyment of that. Um, you know, but above and beyond that, what you're seeking is, you know, a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, you know, I, I think with the pre rot like, you know, one plus one equals two, yeah, 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 that's fine. They're both there, you know, they're not, you know, really, you know, uh, messing uh, one up, um, they're, they're fine. But to get to that greater place, um, I think with dessert in particular, you need a certain amount of sweetness in a wine. And, 
and and it gives you an excuse to explore these amazing styles. Um, you know, uh, Sauterne, Tokai, um, uh, Madeira, um, you know, Port. Um, you know, there's just like so many, uh, uh, you know, amazing sweet wines that no one ever orders. Um, you know, uh, so they're they're just just take that leap. And the other thing too is that you know because they're sweet. They're, they're more durable. So, you know, you get a bottle of, um, you know, like Baron Auslese or, or, or Trocken Baron Auslese, which is fun to say, um, um, or ice vine or whatever. Um, you can leave it in the fridge and it'll be fine. You know, like, like revisit, like that, that exists. So, um, you know, uh, you broaden, broaden the universe. Like, I think, you know, people get really hung up on like one style of wine that they drink, like, you know, explore the space, savor the flavors, you know? Um, and, and that includes sweet or dry. Um, you know, and, and then the other thing is too, like, you know, trot these wines out, these sweet wines out with apparently, um, you know, uh, savory friendly things. So, you know, there's a reason why the French, you know, get all worked up about foie gras and sartarin. It fucking works. It works. You know, you have to be, you know, like a rich, you know, kind of, I, I imagine like rich monks, you know, drinking sartarin and, and foie gras, but, you know, we should all be that lucky. Like it, it it's good. And like these sweeter, um, you know, kind of uh, desserty wines, uh, particularly with like like unctuously fatty things, work beautifully. So like, ah, uh, 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 blow everybody's mind. Like uh, sauterne and like bosom, like you know, uh, you know, Thai, like really spicy Thai food. Like it's it's stupid good. Like they're they're so good. Like sweet wine deserves a place in this world and um, is getting canceled for reasons that, you know, aren't its fault, you know, just like, yeah, go there. Sorry. I do want to say that for weeks, people have been wanting a dessert wine class. It is hard to execute, but I just want to let yeah, everyone we're gonna, know. Yeah, we're going to get there. It's we're going to get there. Told Bill. Yeah, yeah. So it, it should be said that, you know, uh, for the sake of our viewers, like, I've committed to, a, <laughs> in my head, I've committed to a full year of whatever we're doing now. So. We've, we've got ample opportunity. Don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually. It'll be like the most epic wine flight in the world because no one wants a full bottle of dessert wine. Everybody wants like four ounces at a time. So we'll go through all the glass bottles, but I think, I think it'll be fun. And, and actually, uh, um, I, I will say that like, you know, for the sake of the restaurant, one of my, um, you know, great joys is that uh, we have a, a pastry chef working for us now who's incredibly gifted in Annie Coleman and um, it would be a fun, uh, opportunity to work with her too so we we will make that happen uh, it'll happen um you know uh sometime in december but um you know it sounds like a sounds like a fun mandate maybe that could be a fun post-election if we finally no no no, no, no. We, we, we're gonna do something different post-election i don't want to spoil uh uh but i have i have a plan post-election uh it's like an a or b thing so it's gonna be amazing okay. um great segue though we did have a question about all of annie's gelatos and what type of wines would work best with like the roasted fennel and then the Concord grape and then everyone's favorite, the cinnamon toast crunch, which is so bomb. Yeah, again, I want I want something sweet. I actually want, um, with a lot of those, like I really love ice cider, uh, it's, it's super cool. Um, and with like a frozen thing, I want something that feels cleansing and sweet. Um, and uh, apples being really high in malic acid, um, uh, you know, the your perception of sweetness is mitigated by acid. So they, they kind of work against each other. So if you have something that's like really high in, you know, uh, malic acid, then you need more sugar for it to seem perceptually sweet. Um, and, and ice cider uh, plays with that uh, dimensionally in a really fun way. Um, uh, so like Eden ice cider of Vermont is one of our favorites. Um, uh, the Quebecois invented uh, ice cider and there's some really low, lovely like cedar gloss there, but I think that'd be really fun with cinnamon toast in particular, but like I do, I do want, you know, a, a sweeter wine. I want something with more of like a, uh, like a, like a kind of baked white fruit quality. I don't know if I want like, you know, port. I, I want more like that Sauterne, that Tokai, um, you know, kind of style of, of wine. Or, you know, if you do something red fruit or Moscato would be lovely. Um, like a, like a good, good Moscato. And actually Nicki Minaj makes her own Moscato. I like, I don't know if it's good enough, but like it's out there. Um, but like, um, you know, mis Moscato, some kind of like that playful, like white fruit thing, I think could be, could be fun. I, I don't want port as much. I think that like, that like darker fruit thing wouldn't, wouldn't work as well, unless you had something chocolatey, uh, which darker fruit wants. Um, but you know, 
uh, with like the cinnamon toast in particular, like, you know, sauteur and tokai, um, baronos, lisa, ice wine, ice cider, those are the things. But don't, but like, again, oh, and also like, um, don't be afraid of sweet across all categories. So like, uh, like, a, like a really glorious, like uh, white vermouth, um, Dolan Blanc, uh, one of life's great joys, Cap Corse from Corsica, um, uh, any number of Italian white vermouths, like those are really fun after dinner drinks too. That's phenomenal. Um, could you talk a little bit about how Szechuan pepper um, is difficult to pair with? It's spicy, but it's spicy in a different kind of way. Could you elaborate yeah, on that? Yeah, it's like the whole ghost pepper thing. Yeah, it's really weird. Like that's, it's kind of like the short circuiting your um, sense of taste or the ghost pepper, um, short circuiting your sense of taste kind of um, uh, thing that um, asparagus does. Um, and I, I find like, I find those things hugely fascinating. Like, uh, you know, I, I think in as much as you're a wine person, you're like a, you're a taste person. So like, it shouldn't matter. It actually really pisses me off when psalms poo poo people that don't drink. Like, you know, there are a lot of really interesting non-alcoholic beverages that you know, do some of the same things that like, you should just be, you should be about a universe of taste. You know, alcohol is one dimension worth coming together over, you know, but it's not the only dimension. Um, uh, but, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Szechuan, Cuisine, is, it's really weird because there's like a numbing sensation that comes along with it, which, you know, obviously like throws your palate for the, for the loop. It actually reminds me of having talked with, um, so when you, like if you're good enough at what I do, you don't do this anymore. You like consult. So you like work for airlines and shit like that. So I've talked to people that are like better at what I do or have more credentials and stuff and consult. And, and I talked with one person that like consulted for an airline. They're talking about the challenge of, um, wine at uh, 30,000 feet. And one of the biggest challenges is you're in a diminished oxygen environment and that uh, messes with your perception of taste. So you need wines that are extra, that like, um, that are more expressive. So you can't, like Chablis wouldn't work. You know, like these wines that are, are subtle and like, you know, that are, you know, erudite and, you know, kind of like, you know, more polite, they don't work so well. You need like these more bombastic wines and I find that with flavors as well. So, you know, um, uh, like sushi is a great example. Sushi is actually really hard to pair with. Um, not least of all, especially with sashimi because it's not very acid driven. So you, that's why, that's why sake works really well. So um, like rice wine is actually way lower, like the, the pH is way higher than most wines um, and it's softer as such. And it works well with sashimi, which needs something softer. So like Riesling and sashimi don't work because the Riesling is like, way too aggro, dry Riesling in particular. Like you need something that comes off a little, you know, uh, softer with, with, with the sashimi, but like with Szechuan, you want a really loud voice. So whatever wine you do, I think you want a really loud voice, but you don't want something tannic. So that's where I go to these like weird, really floral, like fun, bombastic red wines. So like Ruque, like um, Dry Vichetto, Grignolino, like these like Northern Italian, like fun things like uh, carbonic -y, um, you know, Sangioveses, Grenaches, like these like big juicy reds um, work, um, wines with RS, um, residual sugar uh, work, like Spätlis or Riesling, you want loud voices, but you want loud voices um, that, you know, are round uh, as such um, with, with Szechuan uh, cuisine. Uh, but it's a it's a fun challenge and I, I love, um, you know, I, I once upon a time, um, paired wine at an amazing Thai restaurant in Little Cerro and fucking loved it because there's no tradition there. So there's this old sommelier expression, if it grows together, it goes together. And in a lot of places, there is a hard and fast tradition of what you pair. One of the famous examples being Cassoulet and Madeiran. So um, like there's this old school notion of pairing where a wine completes a dish. So Cassoulet, obviously, you have, you know, all the meats and sausages in the world, beans, and the dish is like unctuous and fatty. And the wine, which is from a great book, Tanat, Madeiran is the designation of origin, it exists to apply tannins and acid to that fatty dish. And it's like the one completes the other. Um, it's funny because in the context of most modern restaurant dishes, and, and, and like John, um, you know, the, my um, husband chef um, in particular, most of his dishes are self-contained, you know? So like if John served cassoulet, he'd put a shit ton of pickles on it. So, you know, the dish itself would be, you know, texturally and, and dynamic and balanced. So that's you know, a different challenge for the sake of the wine. 
Um, but, you know, historically, you know, you had one that, that finished the other. And, and so, you know, with, with Southeast Asian food, it's fun to play around with that because there are no traditions and you can do whatever the hell you want. And I love the fact that there are these strange bedfellows. So you have, you know, who, what could be more different in the world than like a Prussian and a Thai person? Like these are like usually different, you know, you know, cultures and histories and whatever, but like for whatever reason, you know, the Prussian wine goes really beautifully with the Thai cuisine and that's awesome. What else you got? Oh, what happens when you burn your tongue? Uh, you just like sear your taste buds and you're lost. Yeah, that's, that's not it. That's gone for forever and how long does it take to regenerate? Uh, from personal experience, a few days. Um, it's not as damaging as, actually the most damaging, one of us, like, I will say like one of my worst, uh, like it, it's a few days and you typically don't burn all of them and they regenerate really fast because it's like soft kind of mucous membrane tissue. One of my worst flavor experiences of all time was being um, a test taster for a sea urchin, whether it was too old or too young. Um, and, and for those of you that haven't had this singular pleasure, urchin rots from the center in. Um, so there's just like no way to know. And that stayed with me much longer than any, um, you know, tongue burn uh, that I've gotten. But, you know, it just diminishes everything. But it should be said again that like, um, your sense of smell is a driver. The tongue is a blunt instrument and it's, it's more about texture than it is about taste at the end of the day. Um, so losing your sense of smell is much more damaging than your sense of taste. As, as sadly, a lot of people have found for the sake of the coronavirus. And honestly, like why I'm, you know, honestly like somewhat horrified of catching it is because like one of the major side effects is losing your sense of smell and having that diminished. And like, you know, professionally, that's, that's not where I'm at small anecdote i have a friend in new york who got COVID at the beginning of this and it's like months and months later and she's still yeah. keeps fucking eight like yeah. seven months like the the virus is seriously fucking with my livelihood i'm like all, like on a personal level and on a, a professional like on a business you know economic wide level absolutely um well i think this pretty much wraps up um, most of our questions and um, we just have a lot of requests to do a snack pack every week and to do merch for the holidays and um uh, to just really lean into, you know, snacks. Thank you. snacks. Thank you all for those those requests. Um, you know, this has been an amazing journey with you all, and I am hugely grateful that we have as many folks that are, um, you know, still devoted to these lessons, um, you know, 31 weeks on as they were um, at the beginning. Um, and uh, Allison, I want to give you a last word. And Allison, um, it should be said that if you're not on our lesson uh, in future weeks with like a huge glass of wine in hand. I'm going to be personally offended. I'm I'm coming. Um, I will double fist happily. Um, but, uh, excellent, excellent. But so so um, just an imaginary, Allison. I want you so imaginary double fist and lead us out with a, a toast. Um, I I with, with my uh, with my imaginary glass in hand, a toast to all of you. Um, with great thanks for your support of really hard work that nonprofits are doing right now and the mental health of everyone as we get through this pandemic and we get through this election and a huge thank you to all of you for your support of Active Minds today. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>